Good morning and thanks for joining us on Bloomberg Quint Live. You're watching All You Need to Know and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. Asian markets are off to a mixed start after equities on Wall Street struggled for direction on Tuesday. The International Monetary Fund does not see a global recession in the near future, despite saying that the world economy is in a precarious position. UK Prime Minister Theresa May is now seeking support of the Labour Party to back her Brexit deal less than 10 days ahead of the April 12 deadline. Oil prices held near their four-month high as a further cut in production by the OPEC suggests a tightening market. And Metro Metropolis uh, Healthcare's 1200 crore IPO opens for subscription today. The company allotted shares worth 530 crore rupees to anchor investors on Tuesday. Let's talk about Tuesday's Wall Street session. Major indices struggled for direction in the absence of major cues. The Dow Jones snapped a three-day winning streak, while the Nasdaq eked out moderate gains on the back of gains in tech shares. But to tell you exactly what happened in that session, here's Renita Young with this report. U.S. equities are mixed with investors reassessing the strongest first quarter rally in almost a decade. The S&P 500 closing slightly higher, hovering around those highs for the year. And investors, quote, cautiously optimistic. We did see a few movers here in the retail category. Walgreens Boots Alliance dragging down the Dow Jones Industrial Average, saying its lower pharmacy reimbursements actually hurt earnings and lowering its full year 2019 outlook. BlackRock, the world's largest money manager, heading for big organizational changes there, coming after the company made a string of moves to expand beyond index products and more into alternative business opportunities. This also was the first day of trading for Dow under the New York Stock Exchange. That's newly split from Dow DuPont Chemical into three separate independent companies there. And the company, by the way, is still on track to complete its separation of its ag division by June 1st. As a result of everything, Citi downgraded the stock to neutral. Meanwhile, WTI closing at its highest this year above its 200-day moving average, further retreat in OPEX production signaling the global markets are still quite tight in the oil industry and Bitcoin jumping as much as 23 percent its highest level since late November as well as treasuries resuming a rally. And that's a look at your Tuesday Wall Street action in New York. I'm Renita Young for Bloomberg News. All right let's now turn to the action in, in the Asian markets this morning. Uh, Rishad Salamat of Bloomberg News is joining us live from Hong Kong to tell you uh, everything that's happening. Morning, Rashad. Uh, at least uh, about five minutes back, it suggested that the three early risers were going to buck the trend that came in from the U.S. We've got more markets opening now. What's the trend that you're picking up? Yeah, absolutely. And just looking at what's going on, this, this so-called hump day here, markets opening slightly higher. We've got a mixed picture overall, though. Uh, the move mildly up is actually being attributed to reports that officials in Washington and from Beijing have resolved most of the issues surrounding uh, a trade deal. However, they're not dotting the I's or crossing the T's just yet anyway. The big obstacle how to ensure that China keeps to any agreement that is made. OK, let's have a look at those markets. You were just suggesting how they came on stream just a few seconds ago. We've got these greater China indices. We've got Hong Kong's Hang Seng moving to the upside by about four tenths of one percent. Shanghai headed in the opposite direction by exactly the same margin, about half of one percent the declines there. Generally speaking, regional investors looking for some sort of impetus, some sort of concrete impetus to push things one way or the other in a meaningful way. Uh, to cap it, as you've just been hearing, not much of a lead coming out of Wall Street overnight. S&P 500, pretty much a little change. It was down actually for most of the session and yields on the 10-year Treasury remaining below at the 2.5% uh, uh, level. Okay, just have a look at what's going on at, uh, in Japan at the moment. Nikkei 225 uh, at the moment up by about half of 1% elsewhere. What are we seeing? Uh, got an ASX in Australia up by about the same sort of margin, half a percent here. Uh, seeing a little bit of weakness uh, for the Kospi, but it has recovered to be about two tenths of 1% uh, in the green. Uh, global equities have been struggling to push higher, I suppose. We had a very strong start to the week. In fact, we were building on the best quarter we've seen since 2010, encouraging Chinese manufacturing data helping things along there uh, but that sort of shine has sort of waned here as well uh, a couple of questions investors are asking for one uh, will India's central bank be emboldened by the dovish Fed to cut interest rates tomorrow and second what would a repeat of Fri February's terrible US jobs numbers on Friday tell us about the economy there and beyond a couple of things for you guys to ponder as well no doubt thanks so much for that Rashad.
Well, clearly, that's something that's going to be the highlight of tomorrow's uh, session uh, here. Uh, but for now, there's uh, actually concerns about global growth that have been expressed by IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde. She said that the global economy has lost momentum since the IMF last downgraded the global growth forecast in January. Although she said that she does not anticipate a recession in the near term. She, but she points out that the global economy is at a precarious position. Stephen Engel of Bloomberg News brings you more in this report. The IMF uh, just gave its most recent update in January. So these comments from Christine Lagarde in Washington, D.C. speech uh, indicating that the global economy has lost momentum even from January. And keep in mind, in January, that was a downgrade from an earlier downgrade that we got three months prior. So uh, potentially we could get another downgrade in global growth outlook coming on April. I believe it is 9th is when, yes, April 9th, a new forecast is coming from the IMF. What Christine Lagarde says, uh, we're in a precarious position right now in the global economy. Uh, the IMF in January, as I mentioned, lowered the growth projection to 3.5% for this year, 3.6% in 2020. And now she's indicating that while not in recession, we could be seeing lower numbers going forward in that new outlook. Here's what she had to say. We do not see a recession in the near term. In fact, we expect some pickup in growth in the second half of 2019 and into 2020. So you see now what I mean by unsettled. And indeed, the global economy is at a delicate moment. Delicate moment indeed, including the WTO saying uh, they're slashing the global growth outlook on trade to 2.6% for world merchandise trade growth. Uh, that would be the lowest level in three years. Now, the Brexit drama has taken another twist. Unable to gather support from her own party, UK Prime Minister Theresa May has now turned to her political opponents in the Labour Party to seek support for her deal. May's deal, remember, to take the UK out of the European Union has already faced three rejections in Parliament. The latest move comes less than 10 days ahead of the April 12 deadline. Kathleen Hayes of Bloomberg News tells you what juncture we're at at the moment. After so many times having her own deal voted down and members of parliament not being able to come up with anything they can vote on collectively themselves, she has to move ahead. She holed up with her cabinet ministers for seven hours today, hammering out what they could do next. In fact, uh, they even made sure that cabinet ministers had to stay in the room without their cell phones when Theresa May came out to make this very important announcement. Nothing had been tweeted in advance. Here's what she said. I am taking action to break the logjam. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to, to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. So basically, it does look like a softer Brexit may be staying in the uh, customs union. The cross-party plan involves Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn trying to come up with their own deal to present to the EU. But if that doesn't work, they're going to have to go back to the House of Commons, let them vote, vote, vote on various measures. And then that may very well, if, it, if that gets passed, her view, her optimistic view is somehow they'll get that done in time to leave the EU. But there's a lot of ifs there, aren't there? Yeah, a lot of ifs. What's been the reaction from Jeremy Corbyn? Says he'll be happy to meet with her. You know, cross-party talks with Labour have not really gotten very far in the past. Uh, people wonder, will they push for a second referendum? But let's uh, take bear in mind that he also called for potentially a no-confidence vote today. He's talking very positively about working with Theresa May. But nothing definite is on the table yet. And as I said, these kinds of things haven't gone far in the past. A lot of people are skeptical they'll get anywhere now. All right, well, that's the latest uh, from the Brexit. But let's turn to India. Uh, Agam Vakil is here to tell you all about the trade setup for the day in India and also what's happening in the futures and options space. Well, Agam, we're still looking at that number for the Nifty and whether or not it'll hit that number today. We're inching closer every day. Yeah. We are in Jinglosa every day and it's only essentially in the last one or two hours of trade that we actually see big moves come through. And I, I, I reckon investors will be watching out and hoping perhaps that that move eventually comes through for the Nifty too. So while Sensex continues to trade in uncharted territory, uh, it cannot be same for the Nifty just yet. But uh, 
we're going to keep an eye on that one. Of course, uh, we haven't seen too much in the small cap and the mid cap indices. It's flattish moves for the Nifty banking future, um, Nifty Bank essentially too. Why? Because of the weakness in the private sector space. And I, I could talk about that a little more once we have the contributors list. But you know, for now, this is how things are be panning out. Tata Motors, Dr. Reddy, Infosys, ICIC, Bank All Advancing and Trade. Tata Motors continues its up move. So a lot of strength now building in Tata Motors. Uh, Wipro and Vedanta remain largely unchanged. But uh, I was talking about the contribution. Okay, so you know, the, this, is, this is not your ADR picture, but this is your FII picture and again we have about 543 odd cross coming in on the other hand 438 cross moving out uh, from DIIs uh, not unlike what we've seen and this is where I was talking about the what has been bearing down on the indices HCFC bank right at the top we do have some amount of weakness in ICICI and Axis Bank as well even though they don't figure out in this list it is essentially the, the heavyweight banks which are well perhaps providing some sort of resistance to the nifty at this point in time on the other hand HDFC limited TCS and Tata Motors, uh, you know, giving that up move. Yesterday's day of trade was for Tata Motors with that big up move that we saw. But uh, moving on to your futures and options space, uh, we're keeping an eye on the Nifty, uh, which saw 2.2% well, increase in open interest. So, well, uh, some longs building in there. And for the Nifty banking future, longs too with, uh, well, about 3.8% increase. But it's underlying, largely flattish. And as I was mentioning, largely on account of private sector banks. This is where things are getting very interesting now. We're starting to see some more resistance build around the 11,900 call. As you can see, maximum open interest continues to build there. And on the lower end, it's 11,500. While maximum OI stays with the 11,000 put, uh, it's still essentially going to be 11,500 in the near term that we're going to watch out for. And uh, well, this is not uh, surprising, uh, writing around the 11,700 put mark. But uh, the WIX has risen further at around 18. It is at heady levels, there is no doubt about that. And moving on to uh, your, your nifty put call ratio, that has edged up just a bit uh, to around 1.5. Uh, moving on to, uh, well, your stocks which are in the FNO band, no changes here. Just the same three stocks, Adani Power, IDBI, Bank and Reliance Power. And moving on to stocks, uh, again, I'm sure Tata Motors will be in the list. As I, There you have it. Uh, Hexaware and Bharti Etel also uh, looking at very large moves. So we'll be watching out for that. In fact, even DVR, Tata Motors DVR makes uh, this list. And on the unwinding side, keeping, in a home, or keeping an eye on Repco Home Finance, CG Power and Strice Chasson. So we watch out for these names. Uh, Again, your all eyes, Alex, as you have already suggested, is going to be on the Nifty and whether or not it can move on to its lifetime eye. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Yeah. Well, let's uh, have a look at what's making headlines across the globe. Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. Top Republican Mitch McConnell, meanwhile, is warning that President Trump's threat to close the border with Mexico would have, quote, a potentially catastrophic economic impact on the U.S. The president made his threat last week but has not acted since. He says he's pleased with steps Mexico is taking to stop migrants moving north, but reaffirmed he is ready to close the border if he has to. And a faulty airspeed sensor on the Lion Air 737 MAX jet plane that's linked to October's fatal crash had been repaired in a U.S. maintenance facility before the flight. Indonesian and U.S. investigators have examined the work carried out on the sensor by a repair shop in Florida. Erroneous data from that center is thought to have triggered the repeated dives that ended with the plane crashing into the Java Sea. Global news, 24 hours a day, on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keenan. This is Bloomberg. All right. Let's turn to the primary markets now. Diagnostics chain Metropolis Healthcare is headed to the primary market. The company operates 115 labs and over 11,000 touch points to cater to its patients. But what does it offer an investor? Dashan Mehta is here to tell you all about that. Dashan, 
Uh, how, uh, w what really should an investor be looking at when it comes to this company? Yeah, so we'll get to the financials in a bit. First of all, just the basic details of what this IPO is. The issue size is 1200 to 1205 crores because that depends on the price band, which is very narrow, 877 to 880 rupees per share, which means an implied market cap of almost uh, 4400 crores, much higher than Thyrocare, but almost half of what uh, the leader, Dr. Lal Patlab, does. Now, basically, it's a total offer for sale for 1.36 crore shares. The company will not get a single rupee. It is because the investors want to exit. So the promoters are one of the promoter wants to exit 62.7 lakh shares, and the second one is the Carlyle company, C. L. Lotus Investment, which wants to exit 74 lakh share, 74 lakh uh, shares. So that's the trend. Now, post this IPO, what will happen is that the promoter stake will move down from 67% to 55%, and the non-promoter stake will move from 32% to 45%. So that's the trend that you will see after the IPO that has come in. The other factors that we need to watch out uh, is basically what. What is this IPO? Now, this will be the third listed diagnostic company in India. As far as uh, by revenue is concerned, it will be the third largest. Now, what will happen is there are three listed companies. Metropolis will be the third one. There is a company called SRL Diagnostic, but that is part of Fortis Healthcare. It's not individually listed. So, or if you take that standalone basis, uh, it will be the third largest because Dr. Lal comes first, SRL comes second, and then it will be Metropolis. Uh, present in West and South India, so they have a dominant presence as far as this region is is concerned. So that's uh, the portfolio that is there. Uh, basically, if you're looking at the revenues, obviously the margins have managed to cool down from levels of 30% to 25%. But overall, they have managed to get, gather scale from a revenues of almost uh, 476 crores. They've moved to almost 650 crores. And in the first nine months, they've done almost 560 crores. Even profits, if you're looking at it, they're doing much more profits in the last nine months that they did compared to FY16. So there is a positive trend that we're seeing on uh, the growth. And they've been growing at a compounded growth rate of almost uh, 15 to 16 percent. Uh, it's a debt-free balance sheet at this point of time. Uh, decent return ratios on equity, 30 percent. On capital employed, it's 44 percent. And on net worth, it's close to 25 percent. Now, Darshan, you mentioned uh, its peers. Uh, what, what, are th what are the indications with regard to how it compares to those peers? Yeah, so so there are two peers uh, we want to compare it, uh, at least on the listed space, and then three peers on uh, on the overall space. So if you're looking at it at this point of time, uh, Dr. Lal, if you're looking at it, has a sizable command over the North market. So 72% of their revenues comes in from the North market. They have, si they, have, they have negligible presence as far as the Western market is concerned, the Southern market is concerned. Metropolis is it's, it's more divided between the western part and the southern part. So almost 54% uh, uh, comes in from the western part. Uh, almost uh, more than 75% of their revenue, almost 80% of their revenues comes in from these two regions. For Thyrocare, it's basically divided all across. And for SRL, again, they are predominantly present uh, as far as the northern region is concerned and the western region is concerned. So geographically, Metropolis gets majority of the revenues from the western and southern region, which are growing significantly. So that's the geographical mix that you're looking at. Now, in terms of the financial comparison, yeah, that is what we are saying. Uh, on an FI18 basis, Dr. Lal had a revenue of almost uh, 1100 crores. SRL, if you just uh, take it out from Fortis, SRL as a standalone entity did 8850 crores. Uh, Metropolis is 644 crores, and Thyrocare is the smallest at this point of time. The margin profile here is ha it has a it, it has margins which is in line. SRL has problems of its own, that's why the margins are much lower. Dr. Lal, the industry leader, has 25%. Metropolis has 27%, and because of the accounting change that Thyrocare has because of they take the net number, uh, their, their EBITDA margins are 40%. If you, if you take it in comparison to them, they will also feature anywhere between 25 to 27%. So Metropolis's margins pretty much in line with industry standards. Uh, the other parameter that we want to look at is valuation. Uh, Dr. Lal, no doubt, on and this is on an FY19 basis, Dr. Lal, no doubt, is the most expensive at this point of time, 44 times. Metropolis is not cheap, 37 times. And Thyrocare, because of the growth concerns that we've seen, the share price has fallen significantly and the valuation is at 30 times. Uh, what are brokerages saying on what should they do on this IPO? A couple of them have given positive view. Uh, what Sher Khan is saying, investment option for the medium to long term, uh, not something that they, they would want to invest at least in the near term. Uh, and, uh, and Metropolis for IDBI, they're saying they keep a positive stance on the entire IPO. All right. Uh, well, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Uh, really, one uh, of the counters that you have to watch out for in terms of a prospective IPO. But uh, let's turn to the stocks that are already listed. Mishika Parak is here to tell you all about the stocks in the news. Mishika, what's on your list today? 
There are several stocks on my list today, Alex, starting with Wipro. Uh, Wipro completes the divestment of its Workday and Cornerstone on-demand business to All Right Solutions and has received $95.27 million out of the total cash uh, consideration of $100 million. The divestment is likely to be completed by the June quarter of financial year 2020. And on completion of the divestment, the company will receive the remain remaining amount of $4.73 million. Then we have the quarter four update on Marico. The company says that during the quarter they have witnessed stable demand conditions and healthy off-take growth on the back of competitive strength of the franchise. Uh, the operating margin is expected to improve moderately during the quarter as pressure from input costs eased and operating leverage benefits also kicked in. The value-added hair oils had a weak quarter and domestic business delivered volume growth in line with the near-term outlook. Then Mindtree says LNT has made a cash offer of 980 rupees per share to acquire 5.13 crore shares representing 31% via an open offer. Then we have Jet Airways. Additional 15 aircraft have been grounded due to non payment or, uh, to lessers. HEG will increase its stake in Bhilwara Energy from 29.48% to 49%, 4 rupees 162.05 crores. Uh, the acquisition will be completed in the financial year 2020. Biocon will sell and transfer drug substance business to its wholly owned bi uh, biologics unit for 33.3 crore rupees. The company says that the transfer business will help in consolidation of their business. Lastly, we have Ruchil Decor. Uh, they say, uh, Ruchil says that Ruchil Decor says that the Pollution Control Board has allowed the company to operate its manufacturing facility in Gujarat till July 1st on March 29th. The orders were given by the Pollution Control to completely shut the operations from the said plant. Right, thanks so much for that, Mishika. Well, let's turn to Somit now, who is joining us for all the big brokerage calls of the day. Morning, Somit. What do you have for us today? Good morning, Alex. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is Motilal Loswal on Reliance Industries. Now, the brokerage has downgraded the stock to neutral from buy, but has marginally hiked the target price for Reliance Industries to 1457 from 1426. Now, now the brokerage has downgraded the counter to neutral due to a limited upside post the recent rally seen in the share prices of Reliance Industries. Now, it is also expecting the core energy business of Reliance Industries to face headwinds in 2019. Now, for the refining business, it is expecting the margins to be uh, to remain under pressure in 2019 while for the petrochemical business the margins are expected to be lower due to the capacity expansion mm -hmm. announced in the US and China now for the retail business it expects growth to come at a lower margins and for geo it is expecting the growth to slow down due to lower subscriber additions and on the back of this it has downgrade the counter to neutral from buy the second note we have is on Indian IT sector where HSBC uh, says that the growth in bank spending could be patchy going forward with uncertain macro environment in the US it is also expecting clients to defer their spendings on long-term projects. Along with this, the margin worries also, also are also at a peak with onshore wage, uh, wage pressure compounding. Lastly, an appreciating INR is also another key concern for the Indian IT companies that they would see in 2019. Now, on the back of this, they, they have for TCS, they have maintained the hold rating but has cut down the target price to 1900 from 20, uh, 2060 rupees. While for Infosys, they have downgraded the rating to hold from buy and has cut the target price to 780 from 860. Now, it also says that Infosys, though it is best positioned to grow in 2019, but is not immune to these macro shocks and that's the reason they have downgraded the counter to hold from a buy rating earlier. But what the Supreme Court has actually said is that, let's be very clear, it does not find fault with Section 35AA as such. It does not say that the section is unconstitutional and therefore that must be struck down. It has actually indicated that there is nothing wrong with the section per se. But what it finds fault with is the exercise of the power of the RBI under that section because it indicates that for the RBI to exercise power under Section 35AA pursuant to a direction or a notification from the Government of India, it has to be specific. It has to be for a default. It must actually therefore have a rational indicator in terms of what it intends to do. It can't be a scenario saying that all people with blue, with dark hair, now come on, put them in insolvency or all people with uh, white hair after September of this year, put them in insolvency. So it was that scenario of a 
of a power that is carved out in a statute which gives the regulator a particular power, a particular power to do a particular thing in respect to a default and that too after an authorization from the central government. When such is the contour of power, the limited power that is given, the RBI could not have gone ahead and issued one circular to indicate that irrespective of sector, irrespective of industry, irrespective of the position that you are in, you will necessarily go through an insolvency proceeding come September, that is come 180 days from February. Okay, so Mr. Puhai, I do want to tell our viewers that you did represent several of those sectors or companies in those sectors uh, that had agitated against this Feb 12th circular. I also want to ask you a very simple short question. Does this mean after this Supreme Court decision that here on, unless the central government has explicitly asked the RBI to seek or ask a bank to move, you know, an insolvency petition against a corporate debtor, the RBI will not be able to do so? Uh, yes and no. Let me just wordsmith it a little. You are right that yes, the entire fulcrum of this litigation started from the power sector and I represented them through from Allahabad to the Supreme Court. Uh, there were a, a lot of senior advocates representing various sectors including the power sector and power associations. But what, what the judgment now entails is the following. That if you really, irrespective of sector, if you really want to force the banks and compulsorily mandate the banks to take a particular company through a resolution process under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, that exercise of power must be specific in the sense that it must be rationally oriented to a default, which is a case. The central government may notify, indicating that, okay, in the case of a, B, C, D defaults, I am authorizing the Reserve Bank of India to undertake certain actions. But then the Reserve Bank of India must buy a circular, indicate to the bank saying that I am directing a bank or a consortium of banks to necessarily take case A to the insolvency process under the IBC. It can't be a scenario where the RBI says that I am now directing the banks, irrespective of who you are and where you are, for all debts above a particular value in 180 days or in 130 days or in 90 days, you will necessarily take them through an insolvency process. All right, uh, you'll find a lot of uh, interesting things, perhaps not as interesting as the Avengers Endgame, but definitely useful for you on the website BloombergQuint.com. Here's just a couple of stories that you'll find. The Independent Directors Committee formed by Mindtree to look into uh, the open offer by Larson & Tubro has roped in ICICI Securities and Kethan and & Co as independent advisors. The committee has been formed, remember, to give its recommendations on the open offer for the consideration of shareholders. Imami has said that the Delhi High Court has allowed the company to continue airing its fair and handsome television commercial, rejecting Hindustan Unilever's challenge that it disparaged its product fair and lovely. All right, that's all you need to know going into trade today, but do stay tuned. There's a lot more coming up and a lot more to discuss before the markets start. This is Bloomberg Quint.